And the conference, the, the panel moderator is an MIT alum, uh, Chris McLeod. Chris is uh, a life science angel investor who's currently nurturing new ventures as an investor and an advisor for three early stage life science companies. In 2002, Chris co-founded a company that created technology to quickly develop custom antibodies for research and diagnosis. Included on the long list of activities in which Chris is engaged, uh, he serves um, on the executive board of the MIT uh, Sloan School of Management. He recently joined Elm Street Ventures as a managing partner, and Chris will introduce the panel, and they will have a fascinating conversation, which will include some time for questions at the end. So Chris, thank you for joining us. So uh, welcome, and hopefully everyone's ha had a good lunch. And I thought I'd start off, I know as an entrepreneur and uh, fel former business executive, I really want to hear the stories of the, of the panelists, as I'm sure you do. But in my current role as a uh, venture capitalist, I thought it might be interesting to just take a couple minutes to uh, look at the macro level of where the funding is currently going. And, and, and challenging you with a question, which is if we follow the money, is that really uh, in some way indicating where we find the most innovation? And if not, this being a, a school of systems, you know, is there maybe something in the system that uh, is misallocating capital? And uh, we don't want to spend a lot of time on that, but I thought it would be at least helpful to, to raise that question. And I want to start with a slide from uh, Silicon Valley Bank. Uh, Jonathan Norris and his team out there do a great job and have earned a reputation as really understanding where venture capital is going in healthcare. And traditionally, you'll see that it goes into these three main categories. Uh, biopharma, which in, is, is both biotech and uh, pharmaceutical development of new drugs, uh, what we might call devices, and then diagnostics and tools. And if you look at the last three years, You'll see that, especially when it looks at the dollars, and this we're looking at the very early stage dollars going into what's known as Series A, uh, when companies are traditionally being formed and getting their first round of institutional money. Uh, the drugs, uh, investments in drugs has stayed pretty strong. Uh, it's about 1.8 billion last year, and it's on target to do about the same this year. Uh, overall, uh, SVB uh, estimates that we will see about nine to nine and a half billion dollars invested in venture capital in healthcare companies in, in 2016. But if you look at the other two segments here, interestingly, th they are declining. Uh, you know, the devices had a very bad year last year. It's bouncing back a little this year. Uh, and, and diagnostics and tools, likewise, uh, bouncing back a little bit. I, I think you have to ask, you know, what's going on where you're seeing less investment in these two categories? You know, does it mean that there's less innovation opportunities here. Uh, you know, one of the things I might postulate is that when it comes to uh, the devices specifically, we're seeing a consolidation in the public companies. And a lot of VCs depend on exits or liquidity events to return their capital. And I know one of the threats or one of the fears is that with that consolidation, there won't be as many buyers uh, for new uh, startup companies in, in that space. So, th so that is a concern. Overall, if we uh, look at healthcare venture capital investment since 2014, uh, the numbers will translate to about 55% of it in total uh, went into pharma and biotech for drug development. About 25% went into devices and supplies, and, and just a little bit over 10 or 11% went into technology. And when you think about the relative spending of healthcare, uh, only about 10% of healthcare dollars actually go into drugs. So, you know, why this big disparity about where we're investing money and, and where we're actually, uh, you know, as consumers consuming it? And certainly part of it is because new science is enabling a lot of new opportunities in drug development. Because of the, we talked a lot about uh, uh, genomics and the, the new classes of drugs that are coming on the market. Uh, immuno-oncology is, is attracting a lot of money. 
uh, as we start to understand how we can use the immune system uh, to fight autoimmune diseases like, or to fight diseases like cancer. Uh, one of the uh, local companies here, for example, um, uh, known as Moderna, just raised $450 million in one of their rounds to develop a new class of drugs based on messenger RNA. And I guess one of the things about drug development when you, is that it really does take a lot of money uh, to get a product to market, to get it through the trials, to get it approved. So disproportionate investment, potentially disproportionate uh, reward, and, and maybe that's what we're seeing here. Now, the uh, panel earlier this morning uh, was talked about uh, telehealth, and there was a great article um, in June, I think it was June or July, uh, by Ray Dorsey and uh, Eric Topol, which was a, a review piece on the state of uh, telemedicine. And I, I won't go into the telemedicine aspect of it, but as part of that article, they do cite some investment statistics. And, and the one that's really relevant, I think, for us is that out of every $100 spent in healthcare, only 30 cents is reinvested in the way healthcare is delivered. So unlike this, where we're talking about technology improvements, when we're talking healthcare delivery, it has not historically gotten a lot of money. In fact, of, of 22 industries that they, they looked at, uh, health, the health system was 19th in terms of R&D investment, and private insurers were last. And if you look at uh, productivity gains over our last generation, only construction has trailed the productivity gains in healthcare systems. So certainly you can make, a, a, I think, a strong case that we've been underinvesting uh, in healthcare systems. Here's a, uh, a slide that comes from a, a data source known as PitchBook, with a lot, which a lot of us in the industry look at for, to see these trends. And in conjunction with the NBCA, the National Venture Capital Association, they just released the uh, third quarter investment statistics. And what I'd like to highlight uh, on the left are the number of investment, venture investment deals. On the right are the dollars. And clearly, um, there's about, uh, I think this year they're estimating over 74 billion uh, will be invested. And, and one of the largest segments is, is what is they classify as software. And unfortunately, that's probably too gross a, uh, an aggregation of many different uh, types of uh, industries. You know, arguably, even digital health may get somewhat consumed in there. But if you look, you can see pharma and biotech has traditionally been one of the second largest uh, segments to receive venture funds. And if we go back, uh, I want to call your attention to what's labeled as healthcare services and systems, which is really now emerged as the fifth largest segment attracting venture investment. And if you go, so that's sort of the, the orange one, and it's really, uh, I, I think at the first half or the first nine months of this year, it's exceeding, in fact, IT hardware, so it'll probably move up. And if you look back into as early as, you know, like as recently as 2010 even, there was hardly any investment into this segment. So as, as Topol and, and Dorsey point out, uh, you know, since 2011, investment in healthcare system uh, ventures has increased fourfold. So good news is that at least now, uh, the, some of the investment funds are now available for innovators uh, that are in this space. And uh, I'll leave it with uh, this uh, nice diagnostic slide, or this. Uh, the diagram from uh, CB Insights, another data provider, which highlights uh, 82 companies in their database that are involved with trying to change and reinvent the practice of medicine. And you know, you will see some of our traditional categories like diagnostics or, or you know, surgery, but a lot of whole new categories: care coordination, patient experience, uh, patient monitoring, uh, care planning. So a lot of opportunities, and I think that really sets the stage for the panel that. Uh, we've assembled today who will be talking about the innovations that they're making uh, in our healthcare system. So I ask them now uh, to come and join me on the stage. We've got, uh, oops, wrong way. Uh, Sophia Jovic, who's CEO of Prophase, Daniel Silberman, CEO and co founder of MediConnecta, and uh, Dina Katabi. Dina, thank you who's a professor, a MacArthur Fellow, and professor here at the MIT uh, Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Lab. So let's come on up. Should 
Sure. Where do you, okay. And what I'll ask each of you to do is to maybe give a little bit more of an introduction on yourself and, and most importantly about the innovation that uh, is driving your company uh, that each of you are involved with. So, Dina, I'll let you go first. Sure. So I prepared a few slides that are... Yeah, I think you're going to... Uh, hopefully up maybe top they can move us to... Go. Okay. So I'm a professor here at MIT. I am the uh, Andrew and Ona Viterbi professor. And I'm also a founder of a company in the healthcare uh, domain called uh, Emerald, which is non-invasive health monitoring. So my area, my, my technical background comes from health IoT and technology. So I look at technology and their application in the healthcare system. And just to give you a bit of intro to the stuff that I'm interested in, the stuff that we do in my group and post in the company. So particularly I'm interested in healthcare for the elderly. And if you look today at the US, we have 12 million seniors who live alone at home. And for those people, falls are major problems. Every year, we have 2.5 million elderly falls that are treated in emergency rooms for a cost of $34 billion per year to our healthcare system. Now you add to this the five millions of seniors who have Alzheimer, and that add $200 billion per year in care and uh, monitoring and watching over those people. And then you got chronic diseases, a variety of things. So the question is what can technology help you to do to reduce the cost and ensure that people stay safe and healthy as they age? And we know that we want them to age in their home. And what I want to tell you is that technology has advanced dramatically because not only it can monitor many health-related metrics, but it can monitor them in a very non-invasive, easy way that does not require the person to do anything. Basically, we can monitor many metrics using the surrounding wireless signals. So we all live in a sea of wireless signals. Now you are guys sitting here. There are plenty of wireless signals <laughs> around you. We're gonna use this to monitor health-related metrics without asking anyone to wear sensors on their body. So imagine if your Wi-Fi box can use the wireless signals to analyze your motion and mobility. If there is a fall in the environment detected, detect where the fall happens and automatically alert the caregiver whether family or professional caregiver via text, phone, or email, without asking the senior to wear any device on their body. Not only this, these technology today can work from other rooms across walls and can measure all of these metrics without even having to put a device in the same room. So here our device is behind the wall, and I'm going to let you see how we can monitor the gait of this person very accurately using wireless signals. So look at that red dot over there and how it's tracking his motion. All of that based on the wireless signal in the environment through the wall. Can track him pretty accurately. He doesn't have a pendant, a cell phone, no sensor on his body. For all practical reasons, he might as well not know or have to remember that he's being mod. Now, when you have sensors like this in the home, you can monitor everything. You can monitor daily activity. You can monitor how much sleep do I have, when do I get to the bed, whether I'm tossing around in the bed, when I get out of the bed, how often I get to the kitchen, and whether I'm getting enough nutrition. All of that without even having to ask me to do anything or change my behavior or put the sensor on myself. And it turns out that actually this metric that is related to gait is very, very important. So I showed you that we can monitor his gait very accurately. We can monitor it actually to the gold standard in the field and get a metric called gait velocity, which actually has turned out to be a great predictor for COPD, for hospitalization actually for COPD, hospitalization for heart failure, hospitalization for hemodialysis, and a variety of metrics. So if you have 24 seven such monitoring in the home without asking people to change their behavior at all, you can learn early on about issues and avert hospitalization by reacting to them. Finally, I wanna show you that even breathing and heart rate, we can monitor it without asking people to put something on their body. And this is a baby that we are monitoring her breathing. This is her inhale signal, exhale signal, 
And this is her heart rate, again, from distance without putting anything on the person body, purely by analyzing the wireless signal. Now, if you put all of this together and you look at it, you can ask yourself, what can we change in the healthcare system using these technologies? Of course, this has application into telemetry and reducing the cost for both payers and providers, but also it can have application in pharmaceut for pharmaceutical company for clinical trials for safety, patient reported outcome, and some endpoints related to mobility and gait. And to finish, to me, it has many applications because I worry all the time when I'm here with you guys talking what's happening to mom at home, and if she falls, whether somebody would tell me about it. And these kind of measures can help all of us. So this is the kind of things that keep me up at night. <laughs> Thanks. Very interesting. You know, it, it made me think, though, and uh, uh, we were worried about Russians looking at our email. And now we can. <laughs> 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 a little scary here. Uh, yeah, it's all about incentive <laughs> and intentions. So I'm sure the Russians don't want to look at it to do us any good. <laughs> uh, Sophia, it, you know, as we generate all this data, I know that you, maybe you could tell us a little bit about what you're doing in terms of data analysis, sure. yeah? So um, I'm a clinical psychologist by training, um, and I started a company 10 years ago uh, called Prophase, and what we do is data analytics in clinical trials. So we started, um, and obviously looked very different 10, 10 years ago, uh, but we started with a fundamental problem of, you know, we can tell you when a clinical trial fails that it failed, and in retrospect, we can tell you all the 10 different things that likely contributed to that failure. Um, so I'm talking about instances in which you don't know, it's not a negative trial. Um, it is a failed trial. You actually don't know what you spent all that money and you don't know any better um, whether the drug uh, works against placebo or compared to something else. Um, and so we, we chipped away at it in, in, different, uh, in different ways and really it's in the last, I would say, six or seven years that technology enabled what we're doing in a big way and moved us from describing what's going on to actually being able to in intervene in an actionable way. That's a, a topic from, from earlier today. Um, and as an example, tell a, a clinician who is interviewing a patient for a study, what is the contribution, likely contribution of that patient to their signal? What is, um, are there, are there um, aspects of that patient behaviorally that make us think that person is likely to be a placebo responder? or likely to respond in an unusual way. And so for us, the, the journey of the company has mirrored kind of the, the journey of the field as a whole, which has been a movement from, um, you know, just being in awe <laughs> of data to actually saying, can I use it to, is it strong enough for me to use to prospectively make decisions? Um, and clinical trials have provided kind of a natural lab for that uh, but obviously it's going to translate into how care is provided and how disease is managed long term. Great. And uh, Daniel, I know that uh, you've come up with a business that uh, builds on the telemedicine that we heard a little bit about this morning. Maybe you can tell us about that. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> Thanks. Pleasure to be here. I'm Daniel Silverman, CEO of MediConnecta. And um, um, I, m myself, I'm an engineer um, by, by and had a <laughs> consulting career. I came to Sloan, ten year, graduated from here 10 years ago, and went back to doing consulting for a while, part of it which had to do with healthcare. And then by an interesting turn of luck, I ended up starting a telehealth company that uh, from the get-go was uh, uh, geared to serve patients in South America. And um, I, I think we can say today that MediConnecta is probably, if not the only one of the few telehealth players that is truly multinational. We've established a presence in six countries uh, where we have operations, meaning that we have networks of physicians, patients, uh, clients that are uh, uh, using telehealth services, either be it payers or uh, consumers directly or employers, very similar to what's been happening here in the United States. And um, I guess I'd say the, 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 I, from the, the starting point for us was the um, realization that there is this natural imbalance between demand and supply in the, in the healthcare space. 
this takes many forms. It can be geographic because you sometimes have places where you don't have the, the kinds of providers that you need, and this is something that happens everywhere. Here in the United States it happens. It happens uh, more, in a more marked way probably in, in, um, in developing economies, but it's generally the case. You can also have um, that imbalance related to the kind of care that's available. Sometimes specialty care is really unavailable or hard to come by or subspecialty care of, of, of quality. Um, and uh, there are many forms in which supply and demand don't really meet. Uh, so with the emergence of technology, we saw that uh, we had a great opportunity to uh, transform and kind of uh, disrupt that, that reality that the whole healthcare world is, has been plagued by for, for a long, long while. Um, the, the notion was that telehealth could uh, come in and remove those space and time barriers and, um, and by doing so enable a much easier uh, set of interactions between patients and providers regardless of uh, those uh, limitations that the system has. And um, we saw that in Latin America this was a big, uh, a big issue, more so probably than here in the U.S., in terms of the access that people, the average person has and, and uh, the difficulties that they have to go through to get uh, to quality care. And we started out a business that uh, you know, initially was a um, country by country business, but we, currently, we, we very quickly started seeing that if you think long term of, of where telehealth is going, there are a few uh, trends that are very powerful. One is I think that uh, geography, which has been the preeminent deciding factor in terms of who's going to be at each end of that uh, medical interaction will more and more progressively be replaced by things like cultural relevance and language and clinical fit between that patient's condition and the provider who's on the other side. And telehealth is certainly a big enabler for that, uh, which you know, just 10 years ago couldn't have been thought of in the ways that we can start doing it now. Um, also, devices, as we have and, and extensively discussed today, will have a major impact in terms of changing where the location of care will take place as uh, devices are shrinking and becoming more affordable and ubiquitous. So today we can do things that only a couple of years ago were unthinkable, and we can do EKGs and a lot of other things pretty much in a portable way. So that will have tremendous implications as to what kinds of care will be uh, possibly delivered through, through telehealth. And those are the big trends that we saw that were taking place that uh, in a way launched us to start a business that was a multinational uh, telehealth business uh, with a current presence in most of South America now, but also the United States. Well, I find it interesting, you know, you, we have a spectrum and what I often see in, in venture capital too, where Dina has come from it from a technology point of view and, and been able to say, you know, here's an opportunity to apply this technology. And Dennis, on a little bit like you, you did an analysis of, you know, where you thought there might be market opportunities. Uh, so if you, I'm curious, what led you into, you know, pro phase and, and, and you know, how did you then sort of incorporate, uh, you know, some of these new innovations that you, you brought? Um, well, you know, if, if I'm to be perfectly honest, it sort of found me um, <laughs> in that I, I was presenting, so you know, it's, you're kind of in your own bubble, you're presenting research that you think is relevant to maybe 10 people, and uh, my field of, and that's the 10 people who participated in your study. And um, <laughs> I, I, my focus was psychometrics, and so I was looking at um, certain risk factors. At that point, um, it had to do with cognition, so I was looking at certain risk factors for developing disorders and so on. And so I, I had um, presented that research and then I was approached by uh, someone who turns out uh, was working for a big pharma company and said, you know, your research is really interesting um, and we have some data that's uh, very strange and we're struggling to understand it and would you like to look at it? And I was thinking, now I have to, you know, write up a, a proposal, an analytic plan, I probably have to pay them for access to the data, you know. But the data is interesting. And then when he said, no, no, we will pay you to do it, I thought, oh, <laughs> oh that's interesting. <laughs> Let's see where that goes. Um, but I think that you know, some of this is, um, which I, I don't know to what extent this is a, a pharma-specific problem, but um, 
it's very hard to hold on to lessons learned from one child to another. There are a lot of methodological errors that keep repeating uh, because there is kind of a very conservative bent for such an, such an R&D industry. It's a very strange kind of conservative bent to um, development. And um, there was sort of the, the industrialization of, of pharmaceutical research also brought about um, some distortions in what we were seeing. So the, the advent of professional patient, so someone who is going to go to labrats.com and find out what they need to do to get into a trial uh, because of reimbursement to be in the trial. Uh, so there were a lot of these kind of dis distortions from what you would expect to see. Um, and that also opened up an opportunity to say, OK, if you really are running this huge trial with you know, 2,000 people in, in a phase three, um, that's a lot of data and uh, a lot of very educated uh, and very competent clinicians who are doing that work. And that's an opportunity, actually, to learn something about the disorder, about these outcome measures. And for us, really, it's just in the last few years that we've been able to say, OK, knowing that, what can I predict? What, what is sort of the, uh, a term that, that uh, is being used is sort of a, a, you know, a predictive computational phenotype for that person? Mm -hmm. And can I now do that? And that's, um, there is a huge opportunity because the, the pain is big on the other side. Placebo response is destroying trials. Drugs are failing in ways that are very hard to understand. You know, you have a phase two pristine data set, uh, beautiful separation from placebo. You come to phase three, and uh, it gets turned on its head. And so there is a lot of interest and focus in developing innovations that address that. Maybe, Tina, coming back to you, you've developed this technology, and you mentioned you founded Emerald, uh, a, you know, a, a company to try to commercialize it. Maybe you could take us a little bit through your thought process on, that went into that. Sure. So, uh, of course, I come from a technology perspective, and being here at MIT and as a faculty, really our focus is on, is on innovation and what is new. But then when we developed these kind of technology, you know, we started with um, just the ability, like, okay, so that's interesting. We can actually track everything. We can track your motion. We can track your heartbeat from distance. So we will focus on the, on the technology when I started. And then what happened is something actually very personal. My grandfather, um, who lives alone, fell, and it was by pure accident that my uncle stopped by within an hour and rushed him to the hospital. And that changed my perspective about where this technology is most applicable from when we started, which was like smart homes and like making the home react to uh, adjust the heating and cooling according to your motion and when you wake up and learning your patterns to really focus on the healthcare, both for people like me, like um, who worry about mom and dad and uh, grandma and grandpa, and also as you get into this field, started receiving so many uh, other people coming and say, oh, this is actually interesting because I can use it in clinical trials in early stages for like detecting additional metrics. I can use it in post-marketing for adaptive licensing for safety. So we started learning actually from people uh, who come to us and tell us about how they can use this technology in new ways that honestly, when I started, I didn't realize that you can use it in all these ways. But I'm driven by both innovation in technology and really seeing how this technology can affect our life. Absolutely. So as coming back then maybe to, to Daniel, as you've been trying to develop your business, you know, what have been some of the biggest hurdles that you've faced and have had to overcome? Yeah, interesting. So one, one of the things that we uh, learned early on was that when, when you're doing telehealth, uh, the outcomes are very, very good. And I'm referring mostly to primary care, uh, urgent care settings, where about 80% of visits actually are resolved without the need to go and have an in-person follow-up. But there's an issue with um, th the only way that becomes relevant is when you have that be the, the main way in which people are going to the doctor. So adoption and utilization levels are a big challenge because telehealth, even here in the US, and it's been around for a number of years, utilization is still fairly low. So the impact 
if you, from an economic perspective, the bottom line impact that it has on the system cost or the number of people that actually benefit from it and hence the system-wide impact that it can have because of so many people's uh, you know, time savings and so on are still very, very small. Um, now, the reason for that, in my view, is that, well, there's obviously an adoption that needs to take place and happen over time as, you know, each, each person feels bad maybe once or twice a year. So, and then when that happens, they need to be aware that this is an option, that, that it exists, that it's something that they would do. And pretty much everyone that goes on and, and has these kinds of interactions after the, at the end of it says, wow, this is great. I'll never go, 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 go to the doctor again. But you know those numbers are still very small. So one of the challenges is how how do you deal with that? And yeah, so how do you change consumer behavior? And how do you change consumer yeah. behavior? So what we found is that there are ways in which you can drive that to happen faster. I think that long term this is something inevitable. Um, so telehealth for me is a temporary term that will cease to exist in a number of years because this will get integrated into the way medicine is being done and. It will no longer be telehealth, it will be medicine. But, but there's a long transition phase that needs to take place and that follows its natural course. You can do things to um, actually facilitate it and accelerate it and I think we've innovated in some forms doing that. So one of them is by selecting which kinds of settings you do telehealth in. So primary care is one kind of setting but you can do many other things, you can do wellness which is a way in which you can guarantee a certain level of engagement from people that are using this in corporate sites, for example. And that assures you that people will try it out and we know for a fact that after people have tried it out, they really, it really ranks very high in, in, their, in their satisfaction and, and evaluations. Uh, and then the other thing you can do is be very present where people are. So we found that, for example, um, our corporate telehealth model that we've de developed directly with employers where we put up kiosks in a very, the kiosks that are very well designed in a cost advantage way uh, to drive that transition from in-person care to telecare but using uh, a physical environment that kind of brings you in to that interaction have, have had a tremendous power in driving utilization up. Actually, can I follow Felix, up on, on one thing? So I think actually, so of course telehealth is it's going to go and it's very important. But I think one, one aspect that could help is reducing the overhead on, on the patient, which is basically we know in general compliance and adherence are big problems in, in everything, telehealth and clinical trials, everything. So from my perspective, if you can make it very easy for the patients, let's say take, for example, post-acute monitoring, if you want or telehealth for post-acute cases, if you can make it such that the patient does not have to do anything, does not, if I don't have to go sit there and take my uh, vital signs and enter them, if that can be continuously in the environment taken care of, if for clinical trials I don't have to sit down and journal or answer questions, actually my uh, lifestyle and quality of life is just measured in an objective way on its own, then that reduce the overhead on the patient and enable more of us to be willing, even when we, don't, we are not feeling the, that we are really uh, in need of it, that to continue doing it, and continue doing it not just for the first few weeks, but for years. Mm -hmm. Well, certainly that'll transform the system. And I know we want to leave time for some questions, but I thought maybe I'd just close with, you've been successful innovators, which really means using, being able to look into the future and, and trying to project current trends and, and say, you know, here's where opportunities will arise. Where, where do you see the, you know, your specific uh, industry or uh, opportunities developing over the next three to five years? And Sophia, maybe you could start with that. Sure. Well, I can make some predictions, <laughs> mainly for the fun of being wrong, um, <laughs> if this is recorded. So, um, <laughs> I guess the um, I, I completely agree with you that. The, and we are starting to see it, um, the virtualization of the study visit or even of the doctor visit. Um, and I think that it will be a little bit like the travel industry. You're going to have the majority of the people for the majority of things are going to um, actually use virtual ways of, of getting care, of getting diagnosed, or participating in the clinical trial. So the, the virtualization of the visit, especially in combination with sensors and ways to 
to get much more out of a, a virtual setting and not having a person go somewhere. I actually think that that's very close. It sounds kind of, you know, flying cars, and but I actually think it's very close. Um, and the second is kind of, um, I guess the way that I'm going to call it is that the provider is going to become AI enabled. They're going to figure out a way to interact with the information that's being uh, provided about the patient. Mm -hmm. And what that opens up, which is kind of incredible, is you're now no longer looking at a patient as an N of one. You're looking at a patient as a member of a population. And you're saying, what do I understand as a clinician about this patient, but also what does the data tell me about how unusual is this? What is the likely, where is this going to go? And that's the kind of information that um, is very hard to get to without technology. Um, and, and the third thing is that uh, we will, as patients, be able to interact with delivery of care in, in a virtual way. Much, much more so than, than we are now. So not just the visit, but also the treatment, um, also the, you know, and, and that, that goes to implantables, as the panel mentioned before. Um, I think it's interesting thinking about what was raised on that uh, panel, that FDA came out with a guidance for the first time on predictive algorithms. Right. And so, and that actually was driven by the artificial pancreas. So now what, it's not about, it's not insulin that we're approving, it's not the pump, it's the fact that there is something autonomous telling it when uh, this treatment is required. And I think that that's where uh, things are, that's sort of the general direction that things are going to go. Yes, C certainly, and I had some experience with that as well, where you're now analyzing large data sets and how do you get comfortable with making the predictions through a black box? Right. Whereas in the past, you know, clinicians often could see the actual test results. Right and well, use their own judgment. And that's a, that was an interesting point, actually, that was brought up. There was a, a workshop um, at the National um, Academies of Science on Wednesday, and actually the FDA um, uh, hosted it, and, and the conversation was about real-world evidence and the fact that data is, so there's kind of this pristine clinical trials data, and then there's this messy real-world evidence data. And it was incredible to me that uh, you would have someone from the FDA say, right, so that real-world evidence is terrible, <laughs> except for the purposes of making treatment decisions in the clinic. I mean, you sort of have to <laughs> wake up to the fact that this terrible data you would never touch, that's how 90% of your care actually gets delivered. So that's a remarkable opening of sort of mindset that I think is going to drive some of these developments. Okay, well, certainly we could go on for a long time, but... Uh... Can we get the microphones so that we have time for uh, questions? Right here. Sure. Go ahead. My question is to Mr. Silverman. Um, can, you, I'm in, can you hear me? Okay, that's okay. better. I can hear Thank you. you. Um, I'd be interested in knowing more about your experience of doing this in Latin America. Uh, from the experiences that I've heard from others, all different kinds of models have been used in terms of payment. Some cases the employers are paying for it. Some cases the patient is paying for it. Some cases the government is paying for it. Some cases they've come up with very innovative models where somebody else is paying for this treatment. And also in terms of the regulatory structure, we hear about the issues on the US side. But again, on the Latin American side, I hear all kinds of different experiences in different countries. Like in Brazil, the government actually took the very proactive step of allowing telemedicine to take place, reduce the barriers, but the doctor's association went the other way around, and they put up barriers which made the government's policy totally inapplicable. So I'd be interested in hearing your views about uh, how you went about deploying it, because my interest is mainly in terms of large scale deployment of such kind of technologies at a national level. What are the experiences and what are the hurdles and what can be done from a university perspective or others to help overcome these barriers? Okay, well, a lot in that question. Let me try to address as much as I can. So <laughs> on the payment side, uh, our experience has been um, very, very varied. So we've, we've, we have clients that are uh, payers, health insurers. We have employers paying it for their employees as a way to generate productivity gains and also give them a benefit that really drives morale up and, and saves time to the employees. We have some instances in which we are going directly to consumers who are purchasing this as an alternative to health care that they just don't have or don't get. Um, and then tying into, and then another interesting model, we, uh, and this in a way is a, is, is a reference to one of the trends that I see are, are gonna be big trends over the next decade, which is the, 
diffusion or the, the, the elimination of geographic barriers to, to care delivery. So we have uh, plans to sell uh, healthcare, uh, healthcare plans to people that are here in the United States, but that have family members back, in, back home, many Hispanics here, for example, that have family members back home for whom they're willing to pay and give them access through the footprints that we already have in, in, in Latin America. So a very diverse uh, set of payers. Going into the regulatory side of the question, uh, it's generally favorable, but um, it hasn't been developed as much as it has here in the United States. So when I say that, I say it because um, all of the governments in Latin America are very aware of the fact that they have a huge deficit in terms of uh, the manpower that it will require to increase the quality and access of healthcare to the general population. So they're very open to uh, doing things that leverage telehealth. Most of the countries have uh, very advanced uh, laws or, or, or projects for laws that will uh, favor telehealth. Uh, but they're still in early stages. Brazil is an, an exception to that in the, in the sense that they've been very uh, rigorous at, in saying that you, know, it, you can't replace an in-person visit with, with telehealth. I think even there it will uh, evolve over, over the next few years. Uh, but generally speaking, the environment has been favorable to establish uh, these, these kinds of models from a regulatory standpoint. Good. Next. Say, uh, thank you. I just had a question in terms of addressing so the elephant in the discussion around security. Um, I've spent time developing remote monitoring for one of the large device manufacturers. And it's been difficult to get them to, to understand that remote monitoring is actually helpful to them in terms of their pacemaker and their devices. And so how are you developing technology, but as well also the discussion around um, security and, and being able to trust the system in a day and age where we see so much um, uh, infiltration into our own digital systems? Thank you. You want to try some of that? Sure. So, yeah, so security is very important. And I would say not just security, security and privacy. Mm -hmm. So, and you have to, to address both. And you have to address them at the technology level and also at the policy level. And uh, so, even earlier, like uh, as a professor, I looked at security of implantable devices. And we've shown that impl many if implement implantable devices, I can control them just remotely. Mm -hmm. Uh, hacking into them mm -hmm. from a distance. So uh, I think techno it's very important to take technology into account because there are technological solutions to all of these security and privacy issues, but also it's very important to combine them with policies to be sure that when somebody tries to, to, to uh, hack into these systems, also, I mean, assuming that the, I mean, when the hack actually succeeded, typically there is a security breach. Somebody did not apply the security protocol properly. But when it happens, that there is a way also to address it in, in the social system. And I think the critical nature, I mean, because if, if you don't provide that security, then people lose faith in the technology. And very, very much. And, and security and, again, privacy. Also, I want to know that all of my information is under my own control. And particularly now that we're going to see more of that information, not just like everything is going to digital records, medical records. We're saying telehealth and more of that information and um, advocating also monitoring, continuous monitoring. So all of that information, I, as a person, want to know that I have full control over it and other people cannot use it without me consenting to it. Heather? Many of the things we're talking about today um, require new methods in terms of proving safety and efficacy. And I'm curious from a developer perspective if uh, you have any thoughts about on where regulatory science needs to go. Um, so. I'll take this as sort of an interesting um, question because you, you actually need, I think, greater transparency the more complex, um, for example, we were talking about analytics before mm -hmm. and, and sort of then how do you make it predictive? Well, to test it, it needs to be transparent. It can't really be the you know, proverbial back, black box and you, you know, data comes out and a decision, in data, data comes in and a decision comes out. Um, that's, that, that that will have to uh, change, I think, somewhat. 
Um, in terms of the, the regulatory understanding of um, you know, what, what, that, what that will mean, I think that you kind of have an early, um, and uh, it, I'm gonna call it a blunder, or sort of what happened with Sarepta, but I think that that's actually just the initial drop of what's going to be a flood of saying it's not our, our methods for evaluating what's efficacious uh, are not sufficient, and they may not matter, because what actually matters is comparative effectiveness. And that really means I'm in a real world setting, and I'm looking at a whole population of patients, and I'm, I'm interested not to randomize away or rule out covariance. I'm actually interested in understanding them in that, in that context. So I think that the regulatory environment will have to um, catch up to that, and there isn't sort of an easy answer as to how, how do you then, how do you incentivize the right kind of um, risk taking so that people will want to do those types of uh, trials, and then also how do you know that something is effective if it's studied in that way? Great, I know that uh, unfortunately we've come to the end of our time here, and I hope that we continue to inspire you with uh, the tales of some of the uh, innovation that these great entrepreneurs have, are bringing to the market right now. So thank the panel.